Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 862. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 11th, 2024. Thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted, our happy place. This is where George and I sit down and we block out all the outside influences that are trying to to ruin our week. And we sit down and we talk about the news uh, because, first of all, we love news. That's We're journalists. And we, we love giving you the news because we try to be transparent and informative, funny and jovial all at the same time. And sometimes that works. So we're glad you're here. Um, I'm at the Mission Aviation Fellowship in Napa, Idaho this week. We're parked here. I have a relative who's a, 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 a engine mechanic, and he got me a great place to stay at the RV camp. So uh, staying in, in an inexpensive place with Sasquatch is kind of my, my goal nowadays. Uh, I have my shade closed because that's where the sun is. You don't want to see the sun. You want me to be the brightest thing on this side of the screen. George, how are you doing this week? Well, I'm a little a little annoyed. I was supposed to be in Cairo this week for the Global South Fellowship meeting, but my doctor scheduled me for heart surgery this week and told me if I didn't have it, I'd drop dead and didn't want to drop dead in Cairo. Well, all set, and so I canceled my trip, and then, lo and behold, Cigna tells me, eh, wait till July. So, uh Oh my goodness! So well, here you bought. Here I am. Well, so our audience doesn't uh, worry incessantly. You're not having open heart surgery. You're having an ablation where they fix the electrical current for your a full your perfect rhythm. oblation and satisfaction for the yes, sins ablation. of the world. <laughs> ablation. And so, ablation, ablation, and uh, so you, you know you're not in danger of a heart attack. You just you have funny rhythms, you know, which many syncopated rhythms. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I too have frustrations with health insurance. Um, as many of you know that Jill lost her job uh, for the Defense Department, and uh, whereas we both have great incomes, she was the provider of insurance. I'm self-employed, much more difficult to get insurance. Uh, she now has many more job offers. She'll be taking a job in a, a week or two, but there's that gap between the last day of work and the first day at the next company, and you have to fill that gap in America with something called COBRA health insurance it's really expensive that's no problem but the paperwork and red tape involved in getting the card that says you're covered uh, under cobra is absolutely mind-boggling no government entity can be more proud of its slow molasses response than the cobra foundation so we're still waiting for our card um, I, I'm supposed to go pick up my, my uh, uh, Stanton prescription, which if I paid out of cash would be billions of dollars, but if I have my little Cobra card, card it's 30 cents. So I, I'm holding out for that, that 30 cent Cobra card. Um, it's just frustrating, but uh, I, I hear you uh, when it comes to, to health insurance. Once again, we're right on track with each other, George. Let's move on to the news. There's a lot happening out there. Uh, first and foremost on our list here of Severance stories. You said, Kevin, the John Smythe report has been delayed again. And in order to really talk about the the John Smythe uh, uh, report, we need to kind of delve in quickly to the history. We have a lot of new audience members here. And uh, John Smythe was a preacher in the 70s and 80s. He ran the urine camps, uh, bash camps, if you want to uh, be less technical about it. And uh, he had a prevalence for uh, exacting spiritual discipline, which would be outside the norm. Let's put it that way. And that created victims. And we know the victims. We have their stories. We have their eyewitnesses. We know who was involved. We know who knew it was happening. We know who did not report that it was happening. We know that the Church of England has said it's it's sorry, or not, not the Church of England. Justin Welby has said he's he's full of sorrow over what happened, but we don't have a report so that we can avoid what happens again in the future. That's what the the benefit of these reports are. They're transparency. 
They let us know where the church aired. We know where Jonathan aired. So wh where's this report, George? A fellow named Keith Macken, Macken M -A -K -I -N, mm -hmm. was commissioned by the Church of England to review uh, this whole episode. And it was to, as you say, make it clear, transparent, who knew what, when, who did what, when, who didn't do what, when, how do we care for the survivors? And this review is now several years late. And it has been chewed up and delayed by the bureaucratic, it is said, by the bureaucratic responses of the church house in London, the Archbishop's Council and the various participants. And the survivors are now being told, uh, well, this review due the summer of 2024, uh, maybe summer of 2025, maybe the spring of 2025, maybe even the fall of 2024, but whatever it is, we're years now past the due date. Now, why are we talking about this now? We've talked about John Smythe case for years. Smythe was a barrister who was a counselor and a volunteer uh, at the bash camps. And these were camps for upper middle class boys started in the thirties and for by, uh, a to bash. basically teach Christian right. doctrine discipline with the thinking that we're going to raise up a new generation of Christian leaders from the top flight, top echelons of society. And that's what they do. And so now, anybody who everybody who's anybody in the evangelical world uh is an alumnus of one of these camps um from justin welby to nikki gumbel sort of thing mm -hmm. um justin welby was a counselor in the 1970s at these camps he was a dormitory and officer is what they the called services, it. Yeah. something like <laughs> that. and well john uh smythe would engage in sadomasochistic activities with the boys under his charge or care, where in the context of prayer and confession, he would savagely beat them to beat the sin out of them. And the leaders of the bash camps became aware of this, and they did not turn it over to the police. And it would, and they decided they basically said to uh, Smythe, "Leave the country." disappear. And so Smythe went to Zimbabwe and he did the same sort of thing. He set up camps and a boy died at one of these camps. And then he went down to South Africa and eventually passed away. And the, 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 the Macon uh, review is to basically say who was protecting Smythe from political, from criminal prosecution? Who knew about this when and where? And one of the people who knew about this from a teenager on was Justin Welby. He knew about it as his teenager, as a college student. He uh, lived in the uh, rectory in Cambridge of one of the trustees of these camps where and was privy to conversations at the breakfast table about what was going on. He, you know, he knew about, he knew the victims. He knew, you know, from when he was a priest, a dean, a bishop, and an archbishop. And nothing was done. And the promises of an apology, of clearing the air, of reaching out to care for these victims, some of these people committed suicide. Some of these people became abusers themselves. Most of them were scarred in one way or another by the abuse they suffered at the hands of John Smythe. And the Church of England, rather than putting its priorities into safeguarding, putting its priorities into doing the right thing, has put its priorities into protecting the institution limiting its legal liabilities and its potential losses from uh, litigation over the souls and the care of those wounded by people who show, who carry the mantle of the church. Kevin and George, how can you say something like that? How can you say that the Church of England is just protecting itself? Well, in, in lieu of a report, we have to assume something uh, the report is here to to provide us a history of what happened, uh, to provide us a a way forward so we can avoid it in the past. What what I did an episode we did an episode a couple weeks ago. The the title was 
ACNA deposes another bishop. Now, for people in the ACNA, they're like, oh, that's horrible news. That's wrong. The ACNA is going to split. We're broken. We're just another horrible denomination within the, the list of horrible denominations in the church. No. When you're deposing people and holding them accountable, you are doing the right thing. That is a sign of a healthy church. It is not bad news when Kevin posts a story that says uh, the ACNA has deposed another bishop. It's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to see that. But in another respect, that's the transparency and accuracy and salt and light that you want to show the world. That here at the ACNA, ACNA, we hold everyone accountable. Nobody's above the law. Nobody's above the rules. And over there in the Church of England, when we have missing reports and, and rumors and, and stuff like that, we just, what's the point? At some point in the future, we're going to have a report that we needed to see five years ago so we could find a way forward, George. It, it, it's crazy. Well, one of the big political, one of the big things animating the American political scene right now is a sense of a double standard injustice. Mm -hmm. uh, that there are some people above the law, there are some people where, you know, if a little old lady protests at an abortion clinic as pro life, she'll get a 10 year sentence. An Antifa protester will burn down a courthouse in Portland, Oregon, and he'll get a suspended sentence and or maybe uh, community service for one weekend. And there's a real sense among the American body politic that our system is broken. This is what is it, this is analogous to the situation in the Church of England. The a safeguarding system as it stands right now is used by the bureaucracy to get people. It's used to quiet mavericks. It's used to stifle debate. It's used not to care for the victims of abuse, but to preserve the power of the institution. There's a double standard. Um, Justin Welby, uh, the, the, and we are, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Oxford, uh, you know, should not be in office due to their malfeasance in these affairs, in my opinion. Alleged malfeasance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, alleged yeah. malfeasance. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they'll ever be touched. Whereas somebody farther down the line who's in a spat with his archdeacon can be uh, sat on and removed from business office and basically suspended for two years while somebody looks into a complaint that he was mean to one of the ladies in the choir. Um, it's just a, it's an, a system that's congenitally unfair and congenitally broken. We've seen this before, though. We've seen missing documents and reports uh, happen in the Church of England. I remember talking to a reporter who helped type Lambeth 110, who had given the document to the right person he was supposed to, and then the document just disappeared. Oh, that reporter was me. Oh, it was you. <laughs> What's the story at the there? At the 1998 Lambeth Conference, mm -hmm. I was a helper, a volunteer, and that included being a typist. And I typed up Lambeth 110 and took it to the Resolutions Committee. And the head of the Resolutions Committee was a fellow named Bishop Buchanan. He was a white South African liberal. Well, the resolution came up, and it wasn't what I had typed. And he was... Uh, questioned on this by an Australian bishop, one of the Sydney fellows, and he said, well, I couldn't find it, so I rewrote it from what I remembered you said. And, that, well, that was no darn good, because, you know, fortunately, I used a computer, not carbon paper. <laughs> and, you know, they were able to resubmit Lambeth 110. But that's the sort of crap games that take place yeah. uh, to control the authority of the people in power. That's crazy. All right, so we uh, Church of England, if you're watching, and we know you are, some of you sadly have to be paid to watch the program. You're, you're not doing this voluntarily. Please produce the report. Allow it to come forward so we can have accountability within the church. George, we're going to move on to the next story, and I'm going to call this Over the Rainbow. Uh, basically, for the last 15 years, since 2015, when... Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court allowed for uh, gay marriage in, uh, and said it was constitutional. 
there has been a fire hose of uh, creating a rainbow. We have basically been, have this uh, queer community, uh, including trans, just shoved down our throat. And every year we have what's called Pride Month in June. It's a worldwide global phenomenon where uh, every company displays the rainbow flag. Uh, every university has murals all over it uh, in rainbow fashion. It just, it, it is June 1st to June uh, 30th, all rainbow all the time. And if you don't do it, you, you may as well go to jail. This year, I'm sensing something different. Somebody has turned off the fire hose. Yes, it's out there, but it's not being shoved down our throats so much. It's kind of like they've realized they overstepped themselves. And, and they're backing off and saying, you know, people are starting to, to respond to this in a, a negative way. We thought everybody would love rainbows all the time. And I saw uh, a interview with the Pittsburgh Steelers coach who said, we're not doing rainbow stuff. We're, we're here to train to become the best team we can be. Uh, there's six or seven uh, National Hockey League teams that said, we're not doing this this uh, Pride Month. We, we're we here to be athletes, not uh, advocates. Uh, we've seen cities say, well, we're not going to put up these rainbow crosswalks uh, and stuff like that. So um, I, there's a pushback. And the second there was a little pushback, that little fire hose got turned off. And I would say in America, just my observation, this is 10% of what a previous Pride Month was 10 years ago, George. Absolutely. Well, my little rural community, uh, Citrus County, Florida, we do celebrate Pride Month, but that's because we all listen to the music of Charlie Pride. Charlie Pride. <laughs> so that's Pride Month in central, North Central Florida. Uh, but Kevin, you're right. I think the tipping point's been reached, that the uh, intensity it's now pride is being pushed by institutions because it's on their calendars mm -hmm. that they planned six, eight months ago. It's not a living, meaningful phenomena. It's just a dead hand thing. And I'm trying to figure out what it might have been, where the tipping point might have reached. Could it have been the transgender movement? I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, it's no longer the sort of self, the moralizing a force that it once was. Yeah. You could ignore Pride Month today without any fear of any consequences. Mm -hmm. You can make dumb jokes about Charlie Pride and nobody will give a darn. Whereas a few years ago, you know, you would have gotten a stern warning from, uh, we would have gotten comments uh, in the, uh, in the thing about, oh, well, you need to represent, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, well, I think at some point, you know, as frontiersmen, we always have this ability to support the minority. You know, when I'm watching the Super Bowl, if I don't know either team, I'm supporting the underdog. I'm supporting the the the, the team that's less likely to win. Well, at some point... Well, that'll be the Cowboys, but you never support the Cowboys. <laughs> never support the Cowboys. At some point, the, the pride movement had become such an overbearing movement that it became a majority and at that point, I think the the, the average American said, eh, "You don't need my support. You know, you you be, you become a de facto voice, and I don't like the results." When you were a minority, I didn't have to to like the results because I just supported you as an underdog. And I think that that concept we have as Americans of supporting the underdog uh, doesn't no longer applies to the pride movement because they are a majority voice and they are strong but they turned off their fire hose this season. Now, I say it's only June 11th. <laughs> I mean, they may be saving the good stuff for the, ne the next 20 days, but um, I would say, observationally, that uh, the globe is over the rainbow as far as being something that they overtly support. George, we have an interesting story you you gave to me out of South Africa. Um, they just had recent elections there, the Africa... African National Congress has lost its grip on power. It's no longer the majority. It has less than 50%. Now, we need to back up here. I would hope most of you remember your South African history. It used to be ruled by apartheid uh, until uh, 
the, the mid 80s. And at one point, uh, we had it allowed for one person, one vote. And the whites uh, were voted out of power. And uh, Archbishop Tutu was came to prominence as a, a peace advocate in that nation that for a long time, and still today, uh, is does not understand its own ar architecture um, and structure. And so f I guess 7% of, is 7%? Yeah, 7% of uh, South Africa is white. The rest is black. The black had grown up generations of poverty. The white had grown up generations of impoverished uh, wealth and became landowners. Boom, we are in 2024. How do we allow the one person, one vote to become landovers, even though they don't have the ability to understand what that means yet? And so, boom, what we, we have a mess in South Africa, George. The seventh general election since apartheid were held, and the ANC came back with around 40%, mid 40s. Mm -hmm. First, and that, that's down from 67%. And the Democratic Alliance, which draws primarily from the white, the what we call colored or mixed race communities and Asian communities, drew in the mid 20s, and which was their best showing ever. And they already control some parts of South Africa on the local level, like the uh, Cape Town area. Now, under the ANC, they ended their time with three really difficult pieces of legislation. One, ending private medicine as we know it. Doctors could not receive fees for service. Everything must go through the government. Second, uh, uh, hate speech laws. Criticize the government and spout misinformation, which is whatever the government says it is, you go to jail. And third is expropriation of land. The uh, Nelson Mandela had a willing seller, willing buyer mm -hmm. program where if a white farmer wanted to sell his land, the government would fund the purchase of it by a black farmer. Now, the problem was that 90% of that was an utter fiasco, utter failure, where the black farmers basically failed because they were not sophisticated modern farmers. They were slash and burned. I mean, they, were, they practiced the farming that they knew back in the village, not modern farming with, with herbicides and tractors and irrigation and all this and that. Well, that the push for land, but, and it's coming not from on the urban, it's, it's not coming from the countryside, it's coming from the dispossessed uh, Africans living in the great cities, they want their own little plot of land, has empowered radical left parties. And the sadness is that it wasn't the Democratic Alliance who gained in these elections. They didn't gain really any black votes. Who gained the votes were radical left, hardline, parties like Julius Malema's EFF, Economic Freedom Foundation, EF, EF something, mm -hmm. which, you know, sings as their anthem, kill the boar, kill the white man at their uh, rallies. And so we've reached a point where the, the African National Congress, who is corrupt and who basically is self-dealing and does practice an extreme an ex, a DEI but at least the company was the country was semi-stable, even if crime was terrible and the electricity didn't work and the water didn't run. If the EFF goes into partnership with the Anglican National Congress, um, then it's over. There's seven plus million whites got to get out of South Africa and they got to get out now mm -hmm. because whatever they have, it's, you know, is going to be taken from them by a government uh, that carries the guns and is ready to implement policies that uh, are quite abhorrent. Now, why is this an Anglican ink story? Well, the South African Catholic churches have been very vocal about we need to approach this with peace and love and treat e people equally. While the Anglican church in Southern Africa, by and large, has been a toady of the ANC for a generation, for 20 odd years, and will not criticize the government except They'll criticize individuals in the government or small things on the peripheral. But this is the case, you know, out of the Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze, the dog in the night, 
Well, the dog did nothing in the night. Did That's the bark. unusual thing. <laughs> yeah. The South African church, in a time when there is a, a, a spree of killing of white farmers, when crime is out of control, and they are just absent. They provide no moral leadership that, you know, the Desmond Tutus are long gone. And instead you have the, the hacks that run the African church, South African church at the top level. Um, it, I, I'm going to be very pessimistic and say, I, I don't see it because the tribalism of South Africa has only worsened since apartheid started. It's not gotten better. And there's no will on the part of non-governmental entities like the Anglican Church to tackle tribalism. Yeah. Well, the, their only option, you know, as far as they're concerned, is to repay evil with evil. You know, the uh, white man was evil to us for generations. Uh, the only option is to take back the land and to be evil uh, in doing so. And that's because... That that's the only option because the, the church is not there to speak with a voice that we, we, that says we don't return evil with evil, you know that we we have compassion and we don't uh, come out here and just profess to be victims, you know we profess to be Christians we profess to to honor and love as Christ uh, told us to. Uh, what was that greatest commandment? Well, don't even bother with that. So. We shall see what happens in South Africa, George. Um, I hope it's something that uh, has a solution that is uh, woven in Christianity, but I have my doubts. Let's move on to our next story. We, well, actually, do you want to give a, a quick warning to whites in Africa, uh, whites in South Africa? Uh, I think George would encourage you to leave. Whites, educated blacks, mixed mm -hmm. race, Asians, mm -hmm. if you can get out of town, mm -hmm. get out of town. Yeah, uh, there, there, there's a coming <coughs> shock to the system. We have had many document dumps as reporters, people, uh, oftentimes victims, who have not uh, uh, been able to have uh, justice or anything given to them at a local level. We'll say, Kevin George, good example, I was raped by somebody, that person is still a priest, um, and the bishop won't do anything, uh, can you guys help? And to a certain extent, um, we, that, we take that off the, the pages of Anglican Inc., and we deal with that as in a pastoral level. Um, and sometimes it does end up at Anglican Inc., because we can't seem to fix it pastorally. Uh, tell us about some of your document dumps you've got, George. Well, we've gotten some interesting ones. Uh, a viewer who grew up in the West Indies, reports she was raped by her priest. She went mm -hmm. to the bishop. The bishop basically said, ah, that was then, this is now, get over it. And, or uh, a, a case out in a, El Camino Real, where a, a deacon uh, victimized members of a congregation, and the bishop basically told the congregation, be quiet, let it go. If you complain, you won't get any money to support you. Mm -hmm. um, or from Scotland, uh, Anne Dyer, the Bishop of Aberdeen in Orkney, it was suspended almost a year and a half ago for bullying. And she has fought her suspension every moment, every day. She's still paid, though she's not working. They've had to hire a second bishop uh, to cover for her. And they've had uh, to fight, pay the legal fees. And so that the Senate and the Scottish Episcopal Church is going to learn next week that they're 300000 over budget. Uh, and it's due to almost a half million in legal fees over the Ann Dyer affair. Well, and, yes, okay. and yesterday we got a, and yesterday we got some documents from those people who brought the charges against Ann Dyer, saying Bishop Dyer is accusing us of being homophobic and misogynist and this and that. And some of us are gay, some of us are women. But and you know, here's what she did. But the way, but the church is work at the church is working to protect the bishop at all cost. And, you know, damn the diocese and damn the people and damn the financial consequences. The, the club takes care of its own. And we get these documents and some we can run with and some we can't because he can't, can't, you know, can't confirm some stuff. But we could say that the documents we were given comes from the spectrum of 
right to left within uh, the polities of politics. It's not just conservatives feeding us news or uh, orthodox or whatever. We get news dumps from everybody in regards to what's happening. And we're okay with that. But in the same way, we can't respond and uh, trumpet every story we get. Some of these are very sensitive. We've had, you know, in, in the last dozen years, we've had cases where we you, you, you can't talk about it um, because it needs further investigation and it needs to go up a chain and that chain isn't working. Um, Sometimes we take stories down. Um, yeah. I, I got, and it's not that we, that they're mistaken. If they're mistaken, yeah. we correct them. Yeah. But a year or two ago, we ran a story about uh, the Archbishop of Cape Town's son was arrested for shoplifting. And we only ran it because in his convention speech, the Archbishop talked about his grief at his son being arrested for shoplifting. Well, the son wrote to me last week saying, could you take the article down? I've got my life under control. We're in a political season. Dad is being pilloried, you know, because of what I did. And, you know, just sure. I don't want to be a stick used to beat my father. And be honest, I said, sure, no problem. I took it down. Um, and then there's stories we never put up, like the, the Falls Church, or is it Truro? Falls Church. The, 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 Falls youth, Church. Youth, yeah. uh, the Falls Church Youth Minister, mm -hmm. where a youth minister starting 30 years ago was abusive and did some things that regard, necessitated a, a deep dive investigation. And we got a copy of the report. And I got to tell you, it's I'm trying. I'm still trying to digest it because of, what am I reading here? I, I I read the report, and without more information, there's no accurate way to report it. it it's not a, a well written report, in my humble opinion. And so, well, it's we're, sometimes it's not a we're, report. It's a report that seemed to be written to cover people's CYA yeah. rather than a report to inform yeah. people. If I'm going to use something that if we're going to report here, we have to report with some degree of accuracy. And with an inaccurate report, I can't some, report some, accurately. Some degree, some, yeah. some degree yeah. of accuracy. Some degree. <laughs> Jeez. Some degree of accuracy. So, you know, we're left on that. So let's talk a little bit about Bishop Ann uh, Dyer. She was appointed, and I'll say the first DEI appointment uh, for that section Scotland. of the country. Yeah. And... Uh, Look what happened. Diocese of Aberdeen and Orkney was the most conservative diocese in the Scottish Episcopal Church. They really weren't keen on women priests, let alone gay blessings and this and that. And they had an election. And then in Scotland, if you don't have uh, uh, an immediate okay, election, yeah. the, the choice falls to the bishops. And so the bishop appointed Anne Dyer, who had been the dean of Cramner Theological Hall, Cramner Hall Theological Seminary in England. Well, what was not revealed was that she had been forced to resign for bullying from Cramner Hall. And she was a woman who was also pro-gay marriage. And so the Scottish Episcopal Church decided to kill two birds with one stone, appoint its first woman bishop, and appoint somebody who could turn around this conservative diocese to the right thinking ways. Well, she came up and she brought her bullying ways with her. I think there was like one nun white, he was of Indian origin, priest in the diocese who was dean of the cathedral and she basically drove him out and just all sorts of horrid interpersonal relationships somebody who should not have been a bishop because they just can't get on with people um and the complaints of bullying were found and a report was done by a professor torrance who was a, a leading member of the presbyterian church the church of scotland and the Church of Scottish Episcopal Church said, thank you very And he recommended this is unsolvable. She is unfit to be bishop, this and that. And the, and the Scottish bishop said, thank you. We'll take it under consideration and did nothing. And then disciplinary pre measures were brought after the bishops tried to kick this down the can. And now they've spent half a million pounds basically protecting Bishop Dyer from Bishop Dyer's own actions. And so the bishops of the Scottish Episcopal Church are willing to bankrupt the church so long as the Boys and Girls Club isn't touched by the peasants and their complaints about misconduct. 
<sighs> no problem there. So let's move on and talk about... And again, this isn't so much a left-right issue. No, it's not. This isn't a left-right issue in Aberdeen and Orkney. This is yeah. somebody who should be a priest, let alone a bishop. Well, it's a person who... Uh, we, we joke and say DEI hires, but this is a person who was hired because of her gender uh, or sex, uh, because she would have been the first of that, so that's that intersectionality thing. Um, and, uh, okay, she's got some personality conflicts. We can overcome that. We know bishops all over the world with personality conflicts. Uh, how bad could she be? Well, apparently she's pretty bad. And so we're, we're at Charles Le Charles Benison level badness. Okay, we're, yeah. we're, we're we are bad. And so, um, when your desire to serve the church falls secondary to your desire to serve uh, secularism, this is what you get. You know, um, it's a mess. Are there bad uh, conservative bishops in the world? Absolutely. Are there? You know, but they don't make the really news. Kevin, this really is Pride Month in the Scottish Episcopal Church, not in a gay sense, yeah. but the pride of a person who must be a bishop for their own self-gratification and who must be given that recognition and authority. This is why we call pride a sin. Uh, yes, we there's do. an example. Yeah. Uh, it's not just a sin, it's a really bad sin. All right, Welby is touring Central America. Cool. Not North America. Keeps uh, him out of trouble. <laughs> keeps him out of trouble. He's in Panama right now. He was fly he's been flying around in a helicopter. They were going to take him down to the Darien Gap. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the news, that's where uh, that part of the jungle between Colombia and Panama that is very difficult to cross, that yeah. all these migrants trying to reach the U.S. have to cross and some get eaten by alligators or things. Well, Welby was going to go look at that, uh, but uh, weather front forced him back to land down. So there are plenty of sweet photos of him and sombreros and ponchos and eating tacos and things like that. It's This is what we should have the Archbishop of Canterbury doing. This, Something of no substance whatsoever, just photo ops. And I'm fine with that. Hey, please don't. We're not complaining that Justin Welby's making tours and visit provinces. That's your job. Uh, keep yourself off Twitter, keep yourself out of your national politics, and you'll do just fine. Um, the, yeah, the, he said nothing derogatory about the El Salvadorian government, mm -hmm. which is now right-wing pro-Trump. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, as I said, it, this is a sombrero and taco tour. All right, so let's move on to China. Um, we talked about South Africa, where uh, certainly like 4.7 million uh whites are in danger of a government collapse in china the government is after the church and in china they can go and bulldoze churches if they wanted to they have they can burn down churches if they wanted to they have uh they can go and put their pictures inside the churches and replace all the icons and pictures of jesus and mary with their own pictures they have but that's not their long-term goal their long-term goal is to use the church for the state you know, the, the church isn't harmful if it's used for the state and use for the party and done rightly. We, we can do this. So some smart communist, not very many of them, has decided to slowly replace the doctrine of the Christian church, George. The China Christian Council, Three Self Patriotic Movement, mm -hmm. which is the official Protestant church in China, has released a report released a report last month in May that I finally got to read this past week. A five year plan for what they call Sinization, making the church in China more Chinese. And this five year plan uh, touches upon all the things that Kevin mentioned, but it also seeks to change the doctrine of the Christian churches in China. Justification by faith, saved by grace is out salvation by works is in and the works are those that are approved and in concert and in in under the direction and leadership of the communist party so your salvation comes not by your faith but by the work you do to better society and that betterment is determined by what the communist party says 
This, is, of course, is heretical from a nor traditional Christian perspective. Reformed but the Chinese, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that the Chinese government doesn't care. Yeah. yeah in other words, and the, the problem is that, you know, right now that the churches in Hong Kong uh, are being slowly sucked into this. And, you know, they've been forbidden. There was, for the first time, I don't remember the first time ever, there are no uh, services in Hong Kong, masses and services of prayer to mark the Tiananmen massacre. Um, because the churches are being twisted and uh, forced to conform to an image as an appendage of the party. The party is all powerful. The state is all powerful. And your private beliefs only exist so long as they further the agenda of the state. Mm. This is this is George Orwell's world yes. uh, brought into, into sharp focus. I mean, he nailed it. You know, many years ago, he he saw through it when he he wrote his Animal Farm and he wrote his 1984, uh, just a, a clear understanding of the desire of communism to conform everybody except the leaders. And you know, if it can conform uh, a, a body of a billion people, conforming a church is no problem for the Chinese. It just takes a little bit more effort. Ah, but the right. thing is, what do we yeah. do for the, what can we do? Really, all we can do is pray. We can ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen those who are under attack. Mm -hmm. We can ask that there be a change of leadership in the government. But essentially, you and I, Kevin, and because China is closed and is, and the Chinese citizens, except for those in Hong Kong, can't really view us. Um, uh, we do have, we have a viewership from China. But it's because they have access to VPNs. Clearly, we're blocked in China, no question about it. But yeah, I have IP no, we can't, we can't influence, we can't do anything mm -hmm. person to person. But what we can do is pray to God and ask God to intervene, intercede with the, those who are under attack in China. And encourage. And uh, I hate to say this twice in one show, but if you're in Hong Kong, get out. <laughs> you're in Hong Kong. Yikes. Maybe, <laughs> Taiwan, maybe it's at Taiwan, too. All don't right. don't go don't go to South Africa, but uh, get out. All right, let's finish this up. The Global South has kicked off their little meeting in Cairo. Where? No, 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 no. We, not 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 that. What's the the, the thing that the College of Bishops are going to be talking about in private. Where's that? I didn't write that down. The, oh, well. Can I tell you about it? We yeah, please we tell. Talked about oh, it. Well, I don't think we did. So tell me, I'm going to get as much news as the audience here. Come on, lay it on me. ACNA has a rule against no. Uh, oh yeah, I did write that down. Sorry, I didn't write that no down. Mon no Mon no new monastic communities, yeah. and no uh, celebrations uh, or vows of celibacy. They've stuck. You can't do that. Well, one of the things that's emerged out of this luminous church in Franklin, Tennessee, the one that caused all the fun on the internet last week and is on its way out, is that the luminous church supports a neo-monastic community of gay men who have taken a pledge of celibacy and live together in celibacy. And in September, the bishop of the of, uh, Todd Hunter went out to Tennessee for a celebration of a service of court lifelong commitment ceremony consecrating Peter Valk to celibacy. Now, Peter Valk, you may remember the name, was from the Dear Gay Anglicans letter of 2021 that oh, was yeah. such a big hit. Oh, we had, you know, 20, 30,000 views on that one, uh, that letter. Where, some, where an ordinand in the ACNA is basically trying to say the ACNA has it wrong on gay and lesbians. Well, this guy's still around, and he's now been uh, consecrated by Bishop Todd Hunter as a, essentially, a, um, I don't know, a virgin or whatever it is, whatever they're called. I don't know. Now, the problem is, this was September 30th of last year, and there's a moratorium on this. And I've seen some communications and between some of the people sharing this information and some of the ACNA bishops and their responses. Oh, not again. Um, that the rules are meant to 
be obeyed. Otherwise, we've got an Episcopal Church situation where justice triumph trumps over every rule that I have. So are they going to do anything about this? Are there going to be any more consecrations to celibacy? Are there going to be any more gay monastic communities in dodgy Agnes C4SO parishes? What are yeah, the bishops going to do? I don't know. I, I, I saw this and, okay, if you're gay, should you be celibate? Absolutely. No question about it. Clearly called for in scripture. Uh, clearly called for in the in the history and context of the Christian church. Um, should you belong to a community of gay peoples? And, you know, this celebration, it was on Facebook um, and Twitter. There was a guest registry, gift registry. There was a reception. The photos looked like a gay wedding. I mean, who a, a, a vow of celibacy is not accompanied by, you know, a cake and presents and pop music in the background. Um, yeah. Maybe in C4SL. I don't know. I don't, I, I, this story will further develop, as did when Peter Volk put out his uh, Dear Gay Anglican letter. That developed. We had a response from the College of Bishops. Uh, and Foley Beach. Yeah. And uh, basically yes. saying, Foley Beach, what are you talking about? So, in as such, this will develop too, like every good Anglican story should. And we will have a proper response. Um, yes, it came from that diocese. I get it. Um, and yes, the bishop was there. And it, when I look at the photos, I think, did the bishop just solemnize a relationship? Celibate or not? Proof relationship. Yeah. So uh -huh. I just, yeah, this is what raises my blood pressure. This is why I have to take a stand, George. This is why I have to deal with Cobra. <sighs> All 30 right. years th 30 years ago i yeah. talked to some of the people of Poseidon saint john the evangelist ssj up in boston or cambridge and we were talking about celibacy and chastity and what rules they spoke about and they basically were quite clear that there's a difference between celibacy and chastity hmm. they weren't going to get married but that didn't mean they couldn't they had to stop having sex with each other that's the new monasticism in some circles well you say you're not going to get married but you can still have fun in 1988 there's sort of fun i uh i was at a uh, a little uh college conference of episcopalians uh in madison wisconsin and there before us was a monk and a, a couple sisters the monk was in his late 20s early 30s and he spoke of the difference between uh, chastity and celibacy and assured us that uh, um, he would still have a sexual lifestyle uh, with the the opposite sex now in, in the room the sisters were all in their their 60s and 70s I'm assuming he was talking outside of the orders um, it, I, I just astonishing to, to hear this uh, back then uh, if not years later so Yep. Okay. So, last news item: Global South has kicked off its conference in Cairo. Uh, first of all, who's there, George? Two hundred delegates from eleven provinces and three provinces in formation: archbishops, bishops, clergy, and lay people. Mm -hmm. It's an organizational meeting where they're basically going to try to set up structures. Begins today, Tuesday, and we've got uh, Jeff uh, Walton on site. And as soon as we learn anything of interest, apart from what he where he went to dinner last night and all the fun <laughs> foods and, and seeing the camels and the Coptic Museum, once we get past the National Geographic travel log, uh, we'll really start sharing the information he's gathering from his time. Absolutely. Yeah, this is day one. Uh, give some time. Uh, they're also on a different schedule, like, like nine hours before us. So uh, they're going to be speaking in, in jet laggedness. But uh, we'll certainly have Jeff on the program for an interview and updates, and maybe I can get some uh, 
uh, of the dignitaries who are there to do an interview with Anglican Unscripted. That would be really nice. Please contact your bishop or archbishop and let them know that Anglican Unscripted is interested in what they have to say. Um, but what are our expectations? I, I don't want to oversell the expectations for the conference. We're not going to come on this conference and instantly find out Justin Welby is no longer the Archbishop of Canterbury slash leader of the Anglican Communion. That that would be something that takes time, George. Yes. And it's a game of bluff, really. How hard can how hard at what point Justin Welby doesn't have many good cards left in his hand. And the uh, Global South has, got, has been dealt a pretty good hand. And they're essentially playing poker right now. And the stakes are being raised each time. And at a certain point, somebody's going to fold. And I think it's going to be Justin Welby. It might be. First. Yeah, do you remember the, the formation of the ACNA in the, in the golden days of, of GAFCON were under the uh, jurisdiction of a uh, presiding bishop in the Episcopal Church who shall not be named? Uh, she allowed for this uh, um, fierce war to break out where she was the enemy. Uh, Justin Welby is not that level of enemy to the church or to um, the global south. So it, it, should be, it should be interesting to see how this plays out. It's not like it was uh, in 2008-9. Well, you know, she who shall not be named is a new job. What? She's, That's yes. not my notes. You didn't get it. Oh, what, what's she doing no, now? Well, I, we, we don't mention it, but uh, she is now the bishop, uh, acting bishop of Wyoming. That, she gets to spend the summer in, in Jackson Hole. Uh, uh, I'll actually be near Jackson Hole in three weeks. I'll stop by and say stop hi. Stop by and say hello. <laughs> it's Kevin. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> oh, no. All right. That ends this wonderful episode. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 862 Two. 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 Yeah. of Anglican Unscripted.